Greetings to everyone who is joining us today from different media platforms. A special greeting to all the ladies during this Women's Month celebration in our country. I greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Greetings to Apostle Mtetwa and to Pastor Kaya, and thanking you again, Pastor Kaya, for the opportunity to minister to the ladies at Oasis Church, Umlaz. I would also like to give a shout out to Pastor Nogwanda Mpofana, who is our leader as ladies in Umlazi Oasis. And I would like to thank her for sharing with me what was in her heart for OCU ladies. Hence, we have this sermon today. And our topic is bearing fruit that will last. When we as ladies get together and the topic of mother-in-law arises, you hear odd, unbelievable, and humorous stories, some of which are negative and others involve old-fashioned ideas of doing things. But the Book of Ruth, where we are continuing our teaching from, describe a different kind of a mother-in-law. We will read Ruth 1, verse 8. It says, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back to your mother's homes instead of coming with me, and may the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husbands and to me. I love that, coming from a mother-in-law. I want us also to read 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 and 10. I read, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weaknesses. That is, for Christ's sake, I deny in my weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. For me, this scripture fits perfectly to Naomi's story of pain and suffering. And God's grace was truly sufficient for her. So just like Naomi, even in our sufferings, we can depend upon God's grace to finish strong. Naomi was Ruth's mother-in-law. We all know that. Naomi's family moved from Bethlehem to the country of Moab due to a severe famine that was in Bethlehem, Judah. During their stay in Moab, Naomi's husband, Elimelech, died, leaving her with her two sons, Malon and Chilion. Malon married Ruth and Chilion married Opa. About 10 years later, both Malon and Chilion also died. Naomi was now left with her two daughters-in-law. Naomi decided to go back to Bethlehem, Judah, since she heard that the famine was over. She then encouraged both Ruth and Opa to go back to their parents' homes and start their lives over. Naomi thanked both Ruth and Opa for their kindness to their late husbands and to her. She blessed them, saying, May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. In her desperate situation, Naomi had a selfless attitude of releasing her daughters-in-law with a blessing. Naomi, like Naomi, we can find it in ourselves to firstly 
consider the needs of others and not just our own. And when you act selflessly, others are encouraged to follow your example. Opa kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth insisted on going to Bethlehem with her, saying, stop urging me to abandon you. Only death will be able to separate me from you. Naomi then realized that Ruth was determined to go with her and they both went on until they came to Bethlehem. Naomi knew the hardships that she was going to face as a widow with no more sons. There was almost nothing worse than being a widow during the times of the Old, Old Testament, Basalwan. Widows were often living in lack, such that in Israel's law, provision was made that the brother of the dead husband should marry the widow. You can read about that in Deuteronomy 25 from verse 5. But in the midst of those trying times, we still find widows that were used by God to fulfill his purpose. We all know the widow of Zarephath in 1 Kings 17. God used this widow who had one meal left to feed Elijah the prophet. Because she believed Elijah's words, her obedience resulted in constant provision of flour and oil until the end of the drought season. In Luke 2, verses 36 to 38, there is another widow who was a prophetess, and her name was Anna. She was of great age, and did not depart from the temple. She served God with prayers and fastings day and night. When she saw Jesus as a baby brought into the temple by his parents, she confirmed that he is the greatly anticipated Messiah. Let's go back to our story of Naomi. So Naomi arrived in Bethlehem, and when she arrived, the women welcomed her, but she expressed her bitterness and pain to the women who were welcoming her. She even stated that she wished that her name could be changed to Mara, which means bitter, instead of pleasant, which was the meaning of her real name. Naomi seemed to have lost sight of good relationship that she was sharing with Ruth. And in times of trouble, Bazalwani, we must not overlook the love and support that God provides us with through our present relationships. And we must not allow bitterness and disappointment to blind us from seeing new opportunities. What was great about Naomi, though, is that in her bitterness, she did not completely lose hope, such that she was able to guide Ruth concerning the Israelites' laws and customs. Naomi sought security of a marriage for Ruth so it would be well with her. What a mother-in-law. Throughout her tough times, Naomi continued to trust God and to believe the best for Ruth. And in God's own time, she was greatly blessed. So those who live each day for Christ will bear fruit not only in their youth, but in their old age as well. This is what we learn from Psalms 92 verse 14. Naomi, in her old age, was able to take care of Ruth's son as if he was her own. Naomi allowed Ruth to see to hear and feel the joys and pains of her relationship with God. 
How often do you share your unedited thoughts about God with your close friend or a family member? Sharing openly about our relationship with God in good and bad times can bring depth into our relationship with others. The decision that Naomi made to go back to Bethlehem enabled her to receive her restoration. Remembering that no, we must all remember that no matter how bad the situation may appear to be, there is a godly solution to it because God has already made a way out of it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to men. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. I would like to conclude this sermon by addressing the topic of spiritual mothering. I want us to read Titus 2, verse 3 to 5. All the women, likewise, are to exhibit behavior fitting for those who are holy, not slandering, not slaves to excessive drinking, but teaching what is good. In this way, they will train younger women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be self-controlled, pure, fulfilling their duties at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the message of God may not be discredited. The, the scripture here is instructing us that spiritually matured women should become mentors to younger women. The Greek word that is translated here as matured women can be understood as spiritually mature woman. Same as the Greek word for younger women, it is not a reference to youth only, but can be understood as new believers. Here in Titus 2, we get the characteristics of a spiritually matured woman. Number one, being holy in behavior. This speaks of a godly conduct or behavior. I, and I believe that this is how Naomi won Ruth to faith of the true God because he had a godly conduct. He was, she was holy in, be, in her behavior. Characteristic number two, properly dressing up for different occasion, for different occasions. Properly dressing up for different occasions is also a part of modeling spiritual behavior. In this subject, of dressing up, the key word is modesty, ladies. You can read about that in 1 Timothy 2, verse 9. Naomi also gave wise counsel to Ruth in preparation of her official meeting with Boaz. Being a teacher of good things is the third characteristic. Being a teacher of good things. That is to have a sound mind which will help you as a spiritually mature woman to train others to develop sound judgment in life. There are also warnings that we get from this scripture. Warning number one to spiritually mature women is that you cannot be a slander making false statements that damage other people's reputations. Warning number two, you cannot be a gossiper, 
talking about other people's private lives. As we continue in Titus 2, verse 4 to 5, we get topics that spiritually mature women can teach younger women. The first topic is to advise young women to love their husbands. And the Greek connotation of love here is to respect and admire their husbands. Number two, to teach them to love and to care for their children. We all know women who do not take care of their children, so they need to be taught. Number three, to teach young women to be pure, self-controlled, and to fulfill their duties at home. The last one, which is number four, to teach those who are married to be submissive to their own husbands. Submission is an attitude of the will, ladies, and a response to love, as well as a means of glorifying God. In closing, the goal of spiritual mothering is to prevent the dishonoring of the Word of God. As much as we all know that the Word of God is honorable, regardless of the behavior of women, but the scripture here highlights an important point that the behavior of Christians plays an important role in the honor that people give to God's Word. So our behavior, ladies, should help spread the gospel rather than hindering it. All of us who are in a position where people look up to us, we must always pray that our lifestyle is motivating others to live in a way that honor God. Praise the Lord.